Were you born to be a king? Can you be trusted with real power? Let's talk about it with Morgan Snyder on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. And we are so glad you're here. You always have a place at our table or in our homes. Um, I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. Matthew Porter's here. Matthew believes that bacon is proof that God exists and loves him a lot. True. And uh, our producer, Jinx, with his Samson-like hair, <laughs> is working hard in his little glass booth. Jinx, get a haircut, son. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, And our video director, John Myers, is in his tech bunker. You might know John's superhero, alter ego, I don't know how to iron, man. <laughs> and Dr. George Bingham is the president of Key Life. George knows that a beard isn't what makes you manly, but he said it doesn't hurt. And then- Look, grow it where you can. Yeah, that's right, because we <laughs> there's certain places it won't grow. And- uh, What are you talking about? <laughs> Just be quiet, Jinx. Yeah, you'll learn. And our friend and former pastor, the Reverend Dr. Pete Alwinson is here. Pete has to be my friend. We have too much dirt on each other not to be <laughs> friends. You and got by it. the way, you need to check out the website, uh, forgetruth.com. And if you haven't read Pete's book, Like Father, Like Son, Consider yourself uninformed and uneducated. We've got, we've got a great guest today. Uh, we talk a little bit before we do this program, and he was not offended, and most are. Most get on the screen and think, what have I done? This is crazy. Still he, on the other hand, is worse than we are, <laughs> and he joined us with the jokes and the fun, and it's good to have him with us. Morgan Snyder serves on the Wild at Heart leadership team and for more than two decades has helped lead sold-out events around the world alongside John and Stacy Eldridge. In 210, he established becomegoodsoil.com and his new book, which I hold now in my nicotine stained fingers is Becoming a King, The Path to Restoring the Heart of Man. Listen, it's good to have you with us, Morgan. Thank you for taking your time to be here. Yeah, thanks, Steve. It actually is refreshing in this day and age to see this much gray hair and life at the same time on a screen. So it's joyful. <laughs> and we're still kicking. You are. And none of us have a cough or a fever because no. we are wearing masks when necessary. <laughs> and we're keeping safe distancing from each other by doing this in our homes. Morgan, I got a question that doesn't have a thing to do with this book. But in the beginning of the book, I don't know whether it was you or John in the foreword, maybe John, talking about how you had gone into the wilderness of Alaska. You'd crossed a river. You had had to fly for hours and then take a to go kill moose or something. My question is... If you first, did you kill anything? And secondly, if you didn't, how in the world did you get it back to the States? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. And uh, it's always adventure. We realize what we're after when we're chasing wild. You know, we're chasing meat, 
because I love a freezer filled with food that I can serve for my wife and my kids where they know where it came from. And it came also from the hands of their dad and their husband. But mostly we chase stories, Steve. We're out there chasing stories. The meat runs out, but the story lives forever. And we were, uh, it was the furthest, most remote place we had ever been. And it felt, um, it's good to feel small. It's good to feel small. They said that the shack we were staying in gets ripped apart by a grizzly about once every three seasons. So you just do the math and hope it's not your year. Uh, we, we harvested uh, a beautiful bull moose and uh, packed it on backs and then an Argo and then a float plane and got it back and used a rappelling system. I've never told this story. We were in John's house hanging this uh, beautiful mount and I mean, how do you put a monster bull moose on a set of stairs open for three stories? And so <laughs> we put a bolt in his ceiling, got out rappel gear, and we we basically set up a belay. And John's pushing it up while I'm backing up with the belay. And Stacy is mortified. And we were <laughs> so happy. Now we repented later, saying <laughs> we should have been more sensitive. But for a moment, all was well in the world. <laughs> And we've never shared that story. I should send you a picture. Yeah, what I want to know is, did you leave the repelling site in his house? <laughs> the hole's still there, right? Yeah. It looks like a bullet hole. It looks like a bullet hole from a perpetrator. <laughs> Morgan, I've been reading your book uh, this morning, and uh, I really like what I'm reading. And I, I have a couple of questions. One is, I want you to tell us about that time not that long ago when you were so lost and empty and uh, were facing, you had everything that anybody in your position would want, but it was kind of a dark night of the soul. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Steve, it's interesting how often the outside of a man does not correlate with the inside of a man that we see men in men's roles, but they're boys on the inside. And what I could have told you um, at the time was I loved God. I had had a radical conversion to giving my trust and confidence to God, but I was still a boy on the inside. And the fruit of that, you know, Dallas Willard said that actions reveal beliefs 100% of the time. And so what you would have found in me was a sense of always being behind, even being a good man and changing the world and leading retreats, always behind, always fear present, always um, a, a sense of lacking in some circumstances around some men. And so I was at a crossroads. I'm passionate. I've always been, I wanted life. I wanted to become, I think I would name it wholehearted. And I looked around Steve at older men and asked, why are they getting taken out? Why are the headlines filled with stories of men mishandling power? And why is it no different than the history books? Is there a way to recover a path where we can become the kind of man, the kind of king in whom God is actually glad to entrust more and more of the care of his kingdom. And so it was my pain and my passion that led me to, I guess I would say, um, courageously start asking questions of older men. That, and, and this book is the ultimate result of that, isn't it? It was two decades. Yep. I started where I, I had the pain and I had the dream. So I turned to the oldest man. I asked God and I didn't hear anything. And now I figured that might be typical. Maybe God doesn't speak for about two weeks as a young man. I just begged God, help me find life. What is the path? And he said in time, I want to speak son, but I want to do it through old men. Find the oldest, wisest men you can the men that you respect and start asking questions, find your questions. And so I said, what is life about? What, what, what do I do with the pain? What do I do with these dreams? What do I do with consequences behind me? What's the most important thing? And over two years time, I sat 
had the privilege of sitting with older, wiser men, over 75 men, about two weeks at a time. And they began recovering something. And I realized, Steve, it was something being rediscovered, nothing new, but newly recovered. You know, Chesterton says that every generation loses the gospel, this path of life, and every generation is charged with its recovery. And I felt like I was being handed a treasure map to the thing that I couldn't even name and a possibility that it exists and it was available and there was a way. Oh, man, we're going to talk about that way. And I'm going to ask a question, and we'll talk about it on the other side of the break. There are a lot of women, as you know, who read the title to this. I read a manuscript yesterday by a woman who had been incredibly abused by men, and especially her husband, uh, physically and sexually. And as I read your book and read her book, I wanted her to read your book mm. just to show the difference. But you know, this title is kind of scary to some women. And I want you, and I love the way you dedicated it to your wife and what mm. you said about her. But on the other side of the break, I want you to take those in our listening audience who are yes. part of the fair sex and make them feel better about this whole issue. Don't go away. We're coming back. Steve Brown, et cetera, and we are, uh, we're so glad you're here. By the way, you want to know a little bit about Morgan Snyder, go to becominggoodsoil.com. His book is Becoming a King, A Path to Restoring the Heart of a Man. And Morgan, on the other side of the break, I mentioned that, and I do this often, but I was particularly dealing with a manuscript written by a lady that probably was the darkest thing I've ever read. Mm. The abuse was absolutely horrible. And I suspect that there are women who are listening to us right now who wince at this title and wonder, is this another way to put me under the thumb of some man who's on a power trip? And Morgan, the book is just the opposite, but I want you to address that before Pete asks his question. Yeah, yeah, Steve. I think uh, if I was relating to that woman, first off, I'd want to know her name and I'd want to look her in the eyes and um, simply say, I'm sorry, because that's true. In 22 years of working with men, I've heard horrific stories of men mishandling their power and it ultimately causing harm to themselves and those under their care. I think I'd want to slow down and listen to her story and give her a safe place to be known and to be heard and really validate that pain. Um, you know, my favorite letters over 22 years in this work, uh, interestingly, are the letters that come in from wives who say, thank you. Thank you for giving me my husband back. Like, that's the man I married. I knew he was in there. And this and story after story of men who recover their strength. And it is very reasonable for a woman to come to the, the really painful conclusions that strength is bad and strength is dangerous. And I need to protect myself from harm. But, you know, Lewis, C.S. Lewis in his brilliance said that the problem is it's like castrating the gelding and bidding them be fruitful. We think that by taking away the strength, we can have a man. But in fact, we take away the thing that allows him to be a man. And so the question that causes me to be curious is what is the path of restoration? What is the path of wholeheartedness and healing 
where a man actually can become a trustworthy king, a man who's empathetic and can come to the center of another person's story, another woman's story, and ultimately, Steve, a man who brings his strength in love to a woman rather than bringing his question, always needing an answer from his world to validate himself as a man. Mm. Wow. Yeah, no, that's that's so good. And, uh, you know, I love your, uh, in chapter three, you talk about, uh, you quote Mike Mason, who says that a 30-year-old man is, is like a densely populated city. Nothing new can be built without something else being torn down. And I, I, I love how you build on that. Uh, uh, what would you say is what's got, what's got to be torn down so a man can be built back up into a man of strength? to give the kind of strength positively as you're, as you're talking about, what, what are the things that have to go? Yeah, Steve, that's a really insightful question because what I would say for each, each of us, it's unique and it's universal. Mm. There are things that we all share in common that are themes that come as image bearers. You know, God created us as men, our, our souls have a masculine form. And then there's something very particular to our story, that unique expression of God. And so, you know, we take Genesis, this invitation to rule created in God's image, and he hands us the keys of the kingdom. It's like me turning the keys of my truck, my F-150 over to my 16 year old son and saying, go for it, do whatever you want. And that can go either way. He could drive it into great destruction, or he can grab his friends and go out into the Colorado Rockies and have life-filled adventure. And so what we do with the mandate to rule and reign says everything. And what I would I would suggest, Pete, is we all engineer, Bre- Brene, Brown and call, uh, Brene Brown calls it engineering smallness. We manufacture a life that allows us to be in control, to minimize risk, maximize safety and require that we never have to change. You just look at old men and I love when I see elders, but what breaks my heart most are elderly. And what I mean, the distinction is a person who's not taken the journey of masculine initiation and the least favorite phrase I've ever heard spoken of a human being is that they are set in their ways. Mm. See, we were meant to be transformed where Lewis says that heaven is the consummation of our earthly apprenticeship. It was meant to be a constant path of increasing wholeheartedness and union with God, a recovery of strength. And most people get stuck in static and engineer smallness. And so the question is, what's not working? What's in the way? How do people experience me? How have I engineered a life that allows me to make life work apart from God. It's that that needs to be dismantled. That's so good. I really appreciate that. But we're loath to give up that stuff, aren't we? We're loath to, to let it go because it is comfortable. Oh, it'll cost us everything. I mean, I survived on the comfort of beer and potato chips during the book launch. I was just confessing to John Eldridge. We went to a funeral this past weekend. We had a lot of airplay time. And I said, I willfully said, I am working so hard. I've did 50 interviews in a small amount of time. And I gave myself to Cheetos and not even good beer, cheap beer, just (laughs) some reach to feel good. And it wasn't until the middle of summer where I felt like one morning, early sunrise in Colorado, the father just said, son, are, are you ready or, or do you want to stay there? Cause you can stay there as long as you want in that mud puddle, but it's not life. And your body knows it. Your wife knows it. Your kids see you go put those beer cans in the garage, garbage can spread them around a little bit. Like it's not a secret. And so I want life. Right. And so it took an honesty, a confession and say, I want life. And you know what? That's just a small story. That's not the real thing. And I need to confess and find, find the real thing. Matthew, you want to state your question or make a comment and then we'll get to it on the other side of the break. You know, Morgan, you talk about uh, things that get in the way. And one of those things you talk about in chapter one is this kind of um, reaction that we have to wanting security. And you mentioned three things and, and maybe I can rattle them off on the other side of the break. But when 
I read those three things, it really grabbed me. And I'd love for you to break that out a little bit, yep. the way we reach out to build our own security yes. when we're scared. Good. Hey, we're listening and talking to and seeing Morgan Snyder in his book, Becoming a King, The Path to Restoring the Heart of Man. As a matter of fact, in our culture, men are in trouble. They are. They either become weenies or abusers. And both are horrible to the people they love, to themselves, and to the God that they talk about. Don't go away. Like Jesus, we're going to come back and talk about it a whole lot more. Thanks for listening to Steve Brown, etc. If you like this show, and even if you don't like this show, be sure to get our weekly email, Key Life Connection. Just go to keylife.org slash subscribe for samples. And if you like the samples, we'll send the others to you free. Our uh, guest is Morgan Snyder, and we've decided and voted that we like him a lot. And he's written a book called Becoming a King, The Path to Restoring the Heart of a Man. Morgan, in, in the first chapter, there was something I read, and it, and it reminded me of this moment on an old, old, old TV show. It was Rich Little, who, who's a comedian. He used to do impressions and everything. And he was talking to Johnny Carson. And he broke down Johnny Carson's like six little moves that he does. He does like this. Okay. And so he detailed all these things and Johnny was laughing. And then he leaned into doing one of those things and he caught himself because it was like he had been discovered. He had been yes. seen. His code had been broken and he was just, he didn't know what to do with himself. And That's he's exposed he, the fig, the fig leaf is ripped off, right? Yes. He couldn't make a move without doing something that this guy had just pointed out. And it was like he was caught in a box and that's the feeling I had when I read this thing about what men do when they're feeling insecure. They're like, you know what? I'm feeling insecure. I'm going to build something. I'm going to make a name for myself. I'm going off your notes here. Make a little money or I'm going to get something going. And I'm like, dang, come it, Morgan. I feel <laughs> naked. <Right. laughs> tell, us, tell us a little bit about those things that we reach to reflexively. Right, Matt. Just think about that. We are all so unique. And yet most every man in Western culture has some identification with that. Make a little money, make a name for ourselves, get something going, right? It, it describes the 20s, the 30s, young parenting, young career. And that's not all bad. Actually, at core, and this is so vital, is that's actually really good. Now, where we take it is another question, right? But mm -hmm. the most important thing we can ever know about a person is that we are created in the image of God. He's in there. And I want to say to our precious female listeners, like, I know, but he's in there. There is a good man in there and he is under construction, right? He's under renovation. And so what we have to do is separate this God given destiny, this mandate to rule and reign and exercise a sort of fierce mastery over a kingdom, over somewhere where we have say and what we've done with it. And if we don't take the journey of masculine initiation, if we don't invite God to heal the boy and invite him to shepherd the boy through a process of becoming mature and wholehearted, we manufacture a small story, right? We, we look for cheap, we look for easy, we look for quick, and we become powerful men that don't know how to wield that power. And you just turn on Google and look at the top 10 news stories and ask yourself how many of them are fundamentally stories of men mishandling power. And so the question is, how do we go back to that original design? How do we take that invitation from God where we're handed the keys to the kingdom to rule and to create and take 
barley, wheat, and hops and see what we come up with for good, right? And not for ill and say, what does it look like to steward? And that's an important word of stewardship over what's been put under our charge. Mm. Powerful. So good. Uh, Morgan, um, you've made some references to it and uh, certainly, I mean, it's, it's not new since the time of Adam, you know, men have mishandled and uh, power and, and been confused about their identity, but it seems like in our culture, uh, Western culture, uh, especially over the past few several decades, that it's been especially hard for men, uh, young men, boys coming up in this culture with no role models, with no guidance. Um, seems like fatherlessness is a, a more common experience. Talk a little bit about, and and we're, we'll be going into the break, so maybe we can continue on the other side, but uh, I'd be interested in you talking a little bit uh, and maybe uh, in getting some of Pete's observations as well with mm-hmm. his ministry, but um, just what what that s- produces in, in our culture at this time. Yeah, I would love to dialogue with Pete after the break. And, you know, Gordon Dalby told a story of a nun that worked in prisons and she had these Mother's Day cards and she passed them out. And guys said, I want more cards. I want more cards. She went back to Hallmark to get more because there was so much demand. Father's Day was coming around the corner and she asked Hallmark for Father's Day cards. She went back to the prison with a large supply of Father's Day cards and said, hey, I'm passing them out, whoever wants them. And not one prisoner would take a Father's Day card. Mm. What we do? What do we do with a story like that? Mm. Yeah, boy, you know Ian Ian Crone's deal too about his story. God, my father, and the CIA, and me. Yeah, big. Oh man, listen, we're going to continue this on the other side of the break. This is a book that you ought to have. Uh, If you're a woman, you ought to read it. You'll feel better about it. And if you're a man, it'll make you a king. And then you can get together with other men, go through it chapter by chapter, study it. There is a study guide and you'll be absolutely blown away with the truth of where God has called you and the way he will use you. Don't go away like Jesus. We're coming back. Steve Brown, etc. And we are so glad you're here. And we welcome the women in our audience. Kathy refused to join us. She said, you do this program in your underwear and smoke cigars. And I just don't want to be a part of it. <laughs> and so we got Pete. And I don't know if that's a good trade or not, <laughs> George. Yeah, Morgan. We uh, before the break, we were talking about, um, you know, in our culture in particular, it seems like it's been especially hard to uh, make that transition to manhood, and and the crisis really that uh, men, young men, boys are dealing with in our culture in recent decades. Um, and I'd be interested in you talking a little more about that. I mean, the increase in suicide, um, with fatherlessness, uh, men in prison related to the uh, story that you told, and, and uh, drug addiction, just on and on, how uh, boys and young men are struggling with the idea of becoming a man. Yeah, it's a brutal, brutal time um, on the level of soul to live on the earth. You know, I was in a call with Richard Swenson, the author of Margin, last month, and and he and he said it really fairly. He said the world is getting better and better, and worse and worse at the mm-hmm. same time. Hmm. There's just validation of, you know, the healthcare we have is better than John D. Rockefeller. And I don't think anyone in this call 
has more money than Rockefeller to buy healthcare. The, the technology is amazing, the healthcare. But we live in an unprecedented time, and it's very important to understand that for the soul. I'm not talking about COVID, but we live in a post-industrial age, information age, where it's more and more faster and faster. That progress is the ultimate idolatry of developed countries. There isn't a country on the globe that doesn't want progress. And if you think about that for the masculine soul, progress in and of itself, like money, is not a bad thing. But where we take it says everything with where we've landed. You know, Albert Einstein said that a razor blade, a technology is like a razor blade in the hand of a three-year-old. Hmm. That's what technology does. I want to sit down with Steve Jobs someday and say, do you know what you unleashed with the iPad? Mm -hmm. Yes, amazing things. But that kind of power being given to people that lack wisdom. And so if we live in an age of progress with more and more, faster and faster, and then we layer on that, you guys, the understanding of the human soul and particularly the masculine soul what we find is that we are east of Eden. We are not living in a habitat in which we were made. And the hope is God's goodness is greater still. That the deepest thing we can find when we pull back the fabric of creation is a heroic trinity of this father and powerful and generous and affectionate and this son that makes the impossible possible and the Holy Spirit that's a teacher and a guide that the prevailing goodness will work if we choose to tap into it and open ourselves up to it. So I believe it's unprecedented and there is an unprecedented provision and, and sort of possibility being given to us. So I think it's very important, George, to take very seriously, what did God mean when he made man? What does the masculine soul need to thrive? And what are very simple practical steps we can take in our everyday life to recover masculine strength and find a way to thrive in this world. Mm. Hey. What, what do you mean by masculine strength? Because yeah, so many of our younger men, it seems like are really struggling yes. uh, passivity and um, redefining what masculine strength looks like. Is it taking down a buck in the wilderness or you know, what, what do you think? How do you, how do you interpret masculine strength at the beginning of the 21st century? Pete, I think that's a really fair question because the danger is to make it a caricature. The danger is to make it a version of masculinity. And often it's what I don't have, right? So mm. if you're really comfortable in a boardroom, right? And on the golf course, and then your car breaks down, and you are under the hood and the tow truck guy pulls up and you're both looking at it. And he says the most terrifying question most men can hear, what's wrong with it? And you feel six years old because you go, I don't know what the hell's wrong with it. It was working and now it's not working. <laughs> what's wrong with it is it's broken. Tow it away and fix it, right? So that man is exposed. Now you take a man who's good with tools, who's good with weapons, right? And you put him at a four-star meal with three wine glasses and four forks and conversation about Hemingway. He feels six and he just wants to go take a whiz because that's the only place he feels like he's a man, <laughs> right? We all have a place where we feel exposed and it's not a caricature, the question I think is more important is where do I feel uncomfortable in a fellowship of men? Where do I feel afraid, intimidated, uninitiated? And for a man to recover his whole heart, he has to go towards his fear and encounter, live in such a way where God has to show up. Well, how does the gospel then help him through that? How does grace and the gospel energize him working through those issues? Oh, it's a brilliant question. It's so helpful because at the epicenter of all reality, we find a relationship with a father mm. and a son. God is far more than salvation. It's essential, but there is more. There's restoration. There is initiation. Here's what's fascinating. Jesus was immature. 
Jesus pooped his pants. Someone had to wipe his bottom. He had to grow up. He was a self-centered little boy. Now, please understand, I'm not talking about sinful. I'm talking about from an anatomical, physiological reality. He had to mature. The scriptures say grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. When he was 12, he was in the temple with these brilliant orators, the rabbis, and his parents spent three days looking for him. Was it very thoughtful of him to freak out his mother and not be considerate? But we know he was without sin. He was simply immature. And so he went through a process of sonship. And so my question to every man is, where do you feel behind? Where do you feel like life is up to you? And what if the true gospel was actually father-centered? What if the true gospel is something that God initiates? And our first task is to respond. It's not up to us. We have a father that's orchestrating our initiation if we would choose to respond. Oh, Morgan, this hour has gone very quickly. We appreciate you taking time from a busy schedule to be with us. And you guys, you got to get this book. This is really an important book. We've only scratched the service. Becoming a King, uh, the path to restoring the heart of a man. Morgan, we rise up and call you blessed. Thanks for being with us. Now go Thanks, kill Steve. something. <laughs> Great to be with you. You're a good man. Thanks, Morgan. Guys, we're going to come back and we'll tell you who we'll do it unto next week. So don't go anywhere. Snyder. Don't forget the name of the book, Becoming a King, The Path to Restoring the Heart of a Man. We live in a culture that is really crazy. And if you haven't noticed, you've had your head in the sand. People are saying things that we didn't even think five years ago. Going places that a culture shouldn't go. Naming things that shouldn't be named that way. Uh, pointing out problems and making greater problems and very, very confused. And what Morgan taught in his book and what he said on this interview is that there is a way back. There's a place for change and redemption, but you can't start with yourself because if you start with yourself, you go nowhere. That's why you feel so meaningless and so empty and you wonder who in the world am I and what am I doing here? And then you decide to commit suicide with a six pack and the boob tube. Uh, Get this book and read it and even better, get a Bible and read it. Uh, There are ancient truths that we've forgotten about in both. And uh, you'll be glad to discover those and what it does in your life. At any rate, Morgan Snyder is a man with a message, and it was a good message. Matthew, if you put a wig on, maybe a bra or something, so we can heard? pretend you're Kathy <laughs> and... and uh, <laughs> I want to know if you can bake cookies. <laughs> He's our head of guest relations, but Matthew has talked to Kathy, and he knows who will be here next week. That's right. I got the scoop, and next week it's going to be our good friend Joe Battaglia. He has a new book. It's called Make America Good Again, 12.5 Biblical Principles to Unite Our Nation, Restore True Greatness, and Reshape Our Political Rhetoric. Oh, man, that'll be great. And as an effort at honesty, Joe Battaglia is our agent. So I felt like we ought to say that. We're going to be kind to him because we're so dependent on him. (laughs) 
and his book will be insightful and provocative. And when it's over, we'll all know exactly what to do to make our nation good again. Guys, it's time for us to go. We're coming back next week, same time, same place. It's our fond hope that you'll join us as you did today. Between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. That gives you a wide, wide berth.